Hello, I am Dr. Gladys Kalemazik-Soka, founder and CEO of a grassroots NGO called Conservation Through Public Health. We founded Conservation Through Public Health in 2003, based on experiences I had working as a fast veterinarian for the Uganda Wildlife Authority. We investigated a scabies skin disease outbreak in the then critically endangered mountain gorillas, and it was traced to people living around the park who have very little health care. It made me realize then that we need to also think of the health of the people if we're going to protect these critically endangered species. I've been working with mountain gorillas for over 25 years, starting out as a vet student in 1994, where I did a study looking at parasites and bacteria in the fecal samples of gorillas, comparing those visited by tourists, two of them visited by tourists, two gorilla groups, and one research group visited by researchers. That really was a life turning point in my life because I felt that I just wanted to become a full-time wildlife vet. I had always wanted to be a veterinarian and I set up a wildlife club a few years before that in my high school in Uganda, Chibuli Secondary School, which made me feel that I want to be a vet who works with wildlife. But the experience in Bwindi made me really feel that I wanted to dedicate my whole life to doing this. And I managed to convince the executive director of Uganda National Parks that they need a vet, and this is what a vet can do. And he saw the use of having a vet because guerrilla tourism had just begun. And they were concerned that tourists who come to visit them could give them a fatal flu, such as COVID-19, which could wipe them out. At that time, there were only about 600 in number and everybody was very concerned. So I was hired uh, one and a half years later after that experience at Windy as a fast veterinarian for the Uganda Wildlife Authority. And when disease, we discovered this KB skin disease where unfortunately the baby gorilla died, but were able to treat the rest with ivermectin, we found out that they picked up scabies when they went outside to people's gardens to eat their banana plants. And they found dirty clothing that is being put out on scarecrows to chase away baboons, gorillas, and other wildlife. The people have very inadequate hygiene. And so they were they themselves were not bathing that often. And so they were unlikely to put clean clothing on the scarecrows. And gorillas being curious probably touched this clothing and it spread through the group. So I convinced my husband, um, Lauren Zixoka, to become one of the founder members. He actually gave the first donation of $100 and I gave the second $100. And we opened up a bank account in America when I was doing a zoo medicine residency at North Carolina State University and North Carolina Zoo. After working for four and a half years at the Wildlife Authority, I got an opportunity to do this residency program, uh, which helped us to refine the whole new concept that I'm about to tell you about. Um, and actually, we also convinced someone else who used to help me when we used to go out to collect samples from buffaloes from the Minister of Agriculture, Mr. Stephen Rubanga. He had worked there for over 20 years, and together, the three of us, we built up this team, which has now grown to over 30 people. But however, at that time, I was doing research looking at tuberculosis in the Human Wildlife Livestock Interface, looking at people going close to gorillas who could have TB, and also looking at tuberculosis in buffalo cattle and people who may eat the cattle that have TB that they got from buffalo or directly eating the buffalo through poaching and bushmeat hunting. When we founded CTPH, we had to really redefine in ourselves um, what are the major threats to gorillas. Once gorillas are habituated for tourism, the threat of disease becomes much greater because we can come so much closer to them. And there's a 98% we share over 98% genetic material and can easily make each other sick. So habitat loss is an issue because they're all in islands. The two populations of mountain gorillas, one in Bwindi and one in Virunga that was first discovered when George Shala, Professor George Shala and late Dr. Diane Fossey worked there. 
then the Bwindi population was only discovered in the late 80s, where I've done most of my work. And we found out that having these two populations of gorillas, the reason why they were cut off so many hundred years ago is because of very high human population growth between the two of them. And habitat loss continues to be an issue in all the places where gorillas are found in 10 countries in Africa. Another issue is poaching. In Uganda, people don't eat uh, gorillas or chimpanzees. Um, especially in the southwest part of Uganda where the mountain gorillas are found. You don't eat primates. Um, the Batwa who used to live in the forest, Batwa hunter gatherers, felt that it was a taboo to look into the eyes of a gorilla. And so in that part of the country, we're not so worried about eating of gorillas, but they poach other animals like daika or bush pig, which people end up getting, gorillas get caught in snares and they get speared and they eat them because they're hungry which unfortunately is something which happened during the COVID-19 pandemic. One of the lead silverbacks of Nkuringo group was killed by a hungry bushmeat poacher who was hunting bush pigs. And he, he ended up spearing the gorilla when he was trying to protect his group when he speared the bush pig and it screamed. The next big threat is the bushmeat trade, which is more of an issue with the Western lowland gorillas in, and cross river gorillas in West Africa. But also the Eastern lowland gorillas are faced with stress with that similar kind of threat. But the biggest one that I'm talking about today is disease, because tourism has brought a lot of revenue. In fact, the only gorilla subspecies which is growing in number is a mountain gorillas, possibly because tourism has resulted in local communities benefiting greatly from tourism. Not only are they hired by the park and the lodges to look after the wildlife and to serve tourists who come to visit, but some percentage of every park permit goes to the local community. And it's an act of parliament in Uganda that 20% of the park entry fee goes to the local community and $10 from every permit. And on top of that, they're able to sell crafts to the tourists, very nice crafts looking like this, and they're able to sell food and accommodation. And so with all this, um, tourism is something that we started to look at more closely, especially during the pandemic. With CTPH, we set up three integrated programs, wildlife health monitoring, community public health, and alternative livelihoods, which are integrated. We have a gorilla health and community conservation center where we regularly analyze fecal samples from gorillas and people and livestock who they share their habitat with, and occasionally other wildlife as well. We're trying to prevent disease transmission and we're able to look quickly to see if it's there and either treat the gorillas, but also treat the people and treat the livestock so they don't make each other sick. It's like a One Health Research Lab. And then we also have a, we strengthen community-based healthcare and we've won awards for our village health and conservation team approach where we basically make sure that community health workers also continue to promote conservation, the dangers of bushmeat eating, the zoonotic disease that can spread between people, gorillas, and other wildlife. And so they, they're very aware of this. Then we, through this process, we work with gorilla guardians who had gorillas back to the park when they come out and teach them to also do gorilla health monitoring when gorillas are outside the park and work with the park rangers to do gorilla health monitoring when gorillas are inside the park. The third program is alternative livelihoods where we support coffee farmers living around the park. This is 100% Arabica, which scored 92 points on Coffee Review in 2018 and was among the top 30 coffees that they, that they reviewed in 2018. And when I was, whenever I was checking gorillas, I often, checking on the gorillas, I often cross coffee farms. And these farmers, I soon realized were not getting a fair market or a steady price. And we needed to help them. And so what we did is we set up Gorilla Conservation Coffee. And what happens is that we give them above market price for good coffee, they're trained to do this. We have trained agronomists on our team and a donation from every bag sold goes to support the work of conservation through public health. These same farmers would otherwise be poaching or collecting firewood in the forest. And this is another way to reduce the threats to the gorillas and their habitat. During the COVID-19 pandemic, all of this was threatened like tourists were no longer coming. And so we had to look for markets outside Uganda in order to support the coffee farmers. And we're able to find one UK 
in UK, the Money Rule Beans, and the US GC Coffee USA.com started to buy coffee again in January 2021. Actually, Money Rule Beans placed a second order just before, just after the first gorilla was killed during the pandemic, unfortunately, Rafiki. We lost Rafiki during the pandemic due to a hungry bootnich poacher. But this led us to think that we need to address food security. So we started to provide fast growing seedlings to the communities over there who are really suffering because they were really hungry. They said there were many poaching because they were hungry. And this helped to reduce the pressure on the park and the need for people to enter the park. During the pandemic, of course, our biggest concern was that the tourists could bring COVID to the endangered mountain gorillas and threaten the conservation efforts that have really helped in the numbers of gorillas going up. And so we worked closely with other conservation NGOs and convinced the Uganda Wildlife Authority that people should wear masks. We convinced the government that people should wear masks when they visit the mountain gorillas. This is something that's really, really, really important because there's no way that we can protect the gorillas without them wearing masks. You saw how contagious COVID was. The social distancing increased from seven meters to 10 meters. And on top of that, the hand hygiene really became strict and the boot disinfection. And this has, result, this has really helped to reduce gorillas getting COVID from people. We haven't had cases um, of people getting, gorillas getting sick because of COVID, which is amazing considering how many waves we've had in Uganda, just like everywhere else. The first wave, then the Delta, then the Omicron, with all the implications that come along with that. We also trained the gorilla guardians that when they had gorillas back, they have to wear masks. We actually got a local entrepreneur right for a woman to make the masks, which really helped to keep some people out of the forest during this very difficult time. And it was at a time when surgical masks had run out of stock in Uganda in March 2020, and the cloth masks were able to be used at that point. We also worked with our village health and conservation teams to train people how to prevent COVID amongst themselves. They all have masks. And they also, the hand washing stations went up. So we're really pleased that through our One Health approach to conservation, we were able to mitigate the impact of the pandemic on the endangered mountain gorillas, and were able to influence policy. This, uh, we, we teamed up with other organizations, International Gorilla Conservation Program, we wrote a policy brief as part of the Africa CSO Biodiversity Alliance policy brief for all the 13 countries in the world which have great apes and tourism at these great ape sites. So that they're all adopting this approach and we're advocating to the government, the donors and the tour operators and people who bring and the lodges and the tourists so that when they visit, they don't expect to have a selfie with a gorilla, but instead they're focused on, you know, making sure that they're responsible tourists, they're paying money, the local communities are benefiting, but at the same time, they're making sure that they're not making them sick. Just like they can make each other sick, they should realize the implications on our endangered cousins. And all of this, our One Health approach led me to become an Ashoka Fellow in 2006 for merging Uganda's rural programs and wildlife management programs to create common benefits for both people and animals. We've been humbled by the number, amount of recognition and awards we've received. Thank you very much.